Lord. Um, I praise God I came out a dude as well. All you ladies go through too much. I'm glad I don't have to go through that. Uh, but, amen, that was a interesting introduction. <laughs> uh, birth, birth, birth. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I just, I just want to thank God for um, giving, the, giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, it, was, it was a trying time uh, to, to receive that phone call <laughs> uh, to speak today. Um, we've been going through a lot of things, and um, there's, and I'm, I'm going to be transparent. There's something within me that i got to get out, and I've been fasting um, the past couple weeks to remove it and um, nothing comes but by prayer and fasting the Bible says and I gotta I there's something within me that I gotta remove and it's it's keeping me from excelling it's keeping me from doing more for the Lord that I know that if I if I can conquer this thing this giant that I'm I'm facing right now and it has nothing to do with my physical situation. It's, it's, something, it's something in me that needs to, that needs to be purged out. And, um, and, it's, and it's, it's been trying lately. It's been, it's been rough. Um, it's, been, um, it's been rough. But I praise God for his, his spirit and his comfort and his peace that he's been giving me um, in the midst of the storm, in the midst of... Um, our situation, regardless of what's going on, and, and it, it it brings me back to um, Solomon. He had the decision to pick riches over wisdom, and he chose wisdom. He chose something to bring him closer to God. He chose something to help him excel in his life more than the riches. And Jesus said, "Because you chose that, I'm gonna give you everything." So that shows me to seek Him and His righteousness first, and all things will be added unto you. So with me. Yeah, I can pray. I can pray real difficult, real hard, earnestly, and we'll get into the word earnestly in a minute, but pray real earnestly that this house comes to pass, that our situation comes to pass, that the, that the kids come into my class acting right. <laughs> Lord, help me. But I'm, 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 my focus is on something else, and it's, it's on the Lord, and it's on something spiritual, and I know that everything else will fall into place. This, these, these things that I've been going through, I believe we're all dealing with something. I'm not alone. I know I'm not alone. Um, and, I, and I praise God for your, your prayers. I praise God for your, your, your concern coming to me, asking me what's going on. I really appreciate it. Um, it shows me that we're a family. Um, it shows me that there's love there. It shows me that, you know, me praying for you is just not me praying for you. You're praying for me as well. There's a there's a transaction here, there's a dialogue between us, and there's love. And the base of love that we, that we see through our example, and I'm glad my dad, uh, Elder Piper, said uh, that pastor's a great example because my word is going to be talking about examples that we, that we have within our word and that we have in our lives. And that we got to pay attention to these examples and that we got to honor these examples, these men of God that the Lord showed us, the Lord, that the Lord brought to our attention. And that there's a, God in those, there's a God living inside that man that we are looking up to. I thank the Lord for you all coming out. I, I praise God that you all are faithful. There's not many here today. There's not. But that doesn't matter. That you have a conviction to be here that you have enough love for the Lord to be in his house, regardless of what you're dealing with, regardless of what's going on in your life, regardless of the situations that you may be facing, you decided to come. And that's what I want to talk about. If we can go to 1 Thessalonians 4.16. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and to meet, to meet the Lord in the air, and so 
shall we ever be with the Lord. Those then we which are alive and remain, verse 17 says, Paul thought that the, Lord, that the rapture would come in his time. So he says, we which are alive and remain. He thought it was come, the Lord was coming in his time. So he was, he was living as if every day was his last, as if every day would be the Lord is going to come today. And he was living his life like that. And we need to understand that every day we live, it needs to be lived as if we're not going to see that person again. We need to talk to them and make sure that they hear the word of God. And we got to stop passing by people and think, okay, I got them tomorrow. The situation's not right today. I'm going to talk to them tomorrow. You know, I'm dealing with too much right now. I'm going to talk to them tomorrow. Paul was a great example of how we should be because he was dealing with so much. And I believe my elder Piper was talking about reading um, 1 Corinthians a couple Wednesdays ago. Because of exact, right. Because Paul has been through so much. But still he remained. But still he, 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 he pushed towards the mark. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and pray, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. Preserved translates to being kept by God. Blameless. But I want to talk about the word preserved. Being kept by our God. He is preserving us through our afflictions, He's preserving us through our trials, through our tribulations, with his love and his mercy. Because these trials, these afflictions, these things that we're dealing with every day is keeping us growing. Because we can't be stagnant. If we're stagnant, we'll eventually die. We need to keep growing. And these afflictions, we need to thank God for them. The Bible says, count it not strange. We need to not look at it and be, oh my gosh, what's going on? Why, Lord? It rains on the just and the unjust. If you're doing something right, if you're doing things right in the eyes of God, yeah, it's still going to rain on you. But this is a trial. This is something to make you grow. This is something to help you. And it's going to keep you preserved and your soul in his, in his, in his presence. In Psalms 121, 5 through 8, I have a lot of scriptures, so um, I apologize in advance, but this is Bible study, like Pastor says. So keep your fingers nimble and ready to move. <laughs> nimble. <laughs> Psalms 121, 5 through 8. It says, The Lord is thy keeper, the Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. I, I thank God for Brother Milton. He said that he wanted to, from now on, he wants to just be in the will of God. He just wants everything to fall into place and be in the will of God. And this right here, this scripture, he will preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth even forevermore. He's going to preserve us. He has preserved us even while we were yet sinners. When we were in the world, he was preserving our soul for the time of right now, for the time of our future to speak to somebody, to do with the will of God, to stand out amongst the darkness that we live in nowadays. This generation that is, thinks that everything is, that they're doing is okay, we're here to make a difference. We're here to flip the world right side up because right now it's, it's, it's not right. These youth coming in, these new people coming in, thinking the world out there is everything is okay. And we have to be here to show them and let that light shine and be able to teach them what really is the will of God, what really is the truth, what really is the way things should be and need to be for their salvation to be intact. The Bible says that the Lord will preserve thee from all evil. Even though you were living in sin before, the Lord was keeping you from those things even more. He was keeping you from death. He was keeping you from situations that could have caught you out and brought you on a different path. He was preserving you. And even right now, He's preserving our soul. The more that we go through trials and tribulations, the more that we deal with situations and, and trials that come upon us, 
we're just being another example for somebody to see, oh, wow, that brother, he handled it right. Oh, wow, that sister, she really, she really knew what she was doing because she kept the faith and she didn't get mad and she just let it roll off of her. In Romans 5:8 it says, But God can, commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died in our place. He died for our sins, for mine, for yours, when it should have been us. And this is something that I try to remind the youth once in a while because we cannot forget and we cannot lose the appreciation of what he did for us and the beatings that he went through and everything that, that he dealt with and all the symbolism that goes behind it, that goes back to his word. It's, it's amazing. And the appreciation has to be there. It's got to stay there because if not, there's something wrong. All of us here are preserved and continue to remain in him. Because we're here, we remain. We're not amongst those outside. We're not amongst those that are confused. We're not amongst those that are on their hospital bed right now, not knowing what their future is going to be. We're remaining in his presence. We know what the will of God is, and we're moving towards it. Yes. Our burdens are beginning to form in us. I love Sister Lisa. She's already, her burden is, is to knock on doors and to get the word out. And that is something that's showing that she is pres being preserved. She's being, she's being taught. She's being um, uh, molded exactly the way she needs to in this church because this is what we teach. This is what the word teaches. We need to go out. We need to have a burden. Um, the children, the, the youth, they're coming up and they're singing. They're beginning to have that burden to do something for the Lord. And if you got a voice, use it. Remain and he will preserve you. Um, in Proverbs 30, 12. We'll go to Proverbs 30, verse 12. And it's, I'm going to take it for a twist really fast. Um, It says, there is a generation that are pure in their own eyes, yet is not washed from their filthiness. Filthiness here is, is, is translated into excrement. Okay? It refers to the obvious detestable sin. But in their eyes, there's nothing there. They walk in here covered in their excrement, thinking that everything they're doing is okay, and they're just coming here to, to you know, go through the motions. I'm in church. I'm doing the things that I need to do. But when... They're in here. We need, that's where we need to teach them, like I said before. Out there, these things, these parades that are going on, it looks every, they're trying to say that things are okay. These laws that are, that are putting these drugs legal, they're walking in here thinking that's okay. They're walking in here thinking things are okay when it says literally in this word that this is not the case. And this is where we need to teach them. This is where we need to show them. This is where we need to let them understand that, no, let me show you. Let me show you why this is not okay. There was a situation, somebody came to me and asked me why something um, is incorrect. They, they wanted to know why fornication was not, um, was not correct. And this isn't their fault. This, isn't, this is just the world we live in. Everything, everybody is acting like these things are okay. Everybody is living like everything is okay. It's okay to live with somebody and not be married you know, nowadays everybody's getting married at 30 because they got to try each other out before they uh, put the ring on. And that's the norm. These norms nowadays are becoming regular. So this person wanted to understand why fornication was uh, incorrect and where in the word it's at. And I appreciate that. I, I respect that because they want to know and they want to see so they can learn and so they can excel. And there we go. We went through it. They understood. Everything's good. This is exactly what we need to do. And we need to be ready for these questions because people are going to come to you and ask you these things. And if we have, oh, I know it's in there, but you just lost that person. You just confused that person. Or you just you put yourself in that, um, in that, um, that category, thank you, of these other these people that just, yeah, just come and, you know, do what you need to do. But, you know, as long as you're in church, the Lord will bless you. Um, no, that's not, that's not the case. Um, in Matthew 12, 34, 
Matthew 12, 34 says, O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. He says, O generation of vipers. Now I had to, when reading this, I had to research this animal, this, this, this reptile. Okay, vipers will bite and poison their prey, then release it. They'll release their prey. They're just going to bite it, put their poison in it, and let it go. They will then follow the dying animal, watching it while it's dying, waiting for it to stop, and then they'll consume it. Okay. In Proverbs 12, 5 through 6, okay, the Bible says in 12, 5 through 6, it says, The thoughts of the righteous are right, but the counsels of the wicked are deceit. The words of the wicked are to lie in wait for blood, but the mouth of the upright shall deliver them. They're lying in wait until there's death and then they consume. There's people out there that are trying to come against you. There's people out there that are going to try to cause a stumbling block in you. There's people out there that are going to try to cause confusion. People out there that are going to try to get you to fall back. And then they're going to be right there waiting for you to be like, what was I thinking? Yeah, okay, yeah, that church, no, that's no good, no good. It's not, it's not what it needs to be. Come and let's have a drink. Let's, let's talk about this. Let's figure this out. They're waiting for you to get confused. They're waiting for you to hit that stumbling block and cause yourself to fall away from the Lord. The scripture was immediately, this scripture was immediately after Jesus healed the possessed, blind, and dumb man. The Pharisee said, he doesn't cast out devils, but he is a devil. They were calling Jesus that. They were jealous. They were boasting about being the seed of Abraham. Yet, their, 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 gen, their um, family, their past family, were vipers themselves. Speaking evil and, and doing things for their gain. Yeah, they looked right. They, they put on the show of being righteous. But inside, they were nothing but poisonous people. And these are the people that we see once in a while today. These are these... These people that they, they try to befriend you and, and yeah. they try to talk to you uh, uh, and, get, and, and get into your, your circle and they want to they wanna cause confusion. They want to get you to move because they're jealous of you. They, they want to be, be who you are and they don't, they don't want to see you excel so they're going to try to remove you. Generation of vipers. Let's, it's, it's okay to do this. It's okay. It, they just passed the law. It's okay to do that. What are, you, what are you upset about? Let's go do this. The, it's okay. The norms. This generation is, is, is falling away more and more. It's obvious, detestable sin. These things are obvious to our God. These things should be obvious to us. We have the gift of discernment. We will not be duped. It's obvious, detestable sin. Excrement. They're covered in their own excrement. Walking in here trying to, trying, to, trying to say things are a different way. But we will not be duped. We have a great example. Our great pastor is going to see through it if we can't. And he's going to remove these people. The Lord will remove these people. For out of the heart the mouth speaketh, the word says. If there is evil in somebody, it will come out. This is the year of revealing within our church. But I'm not saying there's any evil in us. I'm not trying to say that. I'm just I'm letting you know that if there's somebody in your circle, if there's somebody in, in, in where you're residing, maybe at your job or at, in your family, let's say. Because, you know, sometimes we were just talking about this. Our, we're, our, our church house is closer than our own blood. And it's because of these people that just want, you know what, why? They just, they just want you to, to just, why are you, why are you in that church? It's, it's different to them. It's uncomfortable for them. So they want nothing to do with it. And they want you to fall out of it as well. If there's evil in somebody, it, come, it will come out. Vipers full of po poison, saying things to hurt, to affect, to stumble, to offend, to cause you to question, waiting for you to fall, and then finish you. The snake and the, the, Satan in the Garden of Eden caused Eve to fall. In Acts 2.39, Acts 2.39, I'm sorry, I'm kind of 
slow. <clears throat> but the, the Lord will reveal them. There's nothing to be worried about. As long as you're praying, as long as you're, you're doing your, your part, the Lord is going to make sure that you will not be duped. There's something, too, that Pastor told me when we were looking at the house in uh, Roscoe. I was talking to him at the campground, actually, and, um, you know, I was kind of getting some, some counsel with him. He didn't see the house or anything like that, but I respect my pastor's um, uh, decision-making. I respect his counsel, and he told me, he told me, you won't be duped, and he said it kind of like, like just real nonchalant, you won't be duped, everything's okay. So I was like, great, let's move forward, let's move forward. So we went to go see the house on the last day. And everything that was wrong with the house was shown. It was revealed. And we weren't able to get it. And at the moment, it was like, man, what is going on? You start to get discouraged. But at the same time, it was like, wow, that's a blessing. Because if we moved into that home, it would have been more of a curse on us than it would be a blessing. And I know that the Lord wants nothing but blessings for us. He wants nothing but good for us, for those that love him. So that was a blessing, not a curse. And that's something that I had to... Uh, me and my wife had to discuss and <laughs> uh, encourage ourselves because we know that the Lord is looking out for us and my pastor knows exactly what to say and that's exactly what it was. We were not duped. We went, everything was not correct and we, we backed out and we got, we're getting our money back, our thousand dollars that we put into it, which was a question, so that's another blessing. Amen. But in Acts 2.39-40, through 40, it says... For the promise is unto you and unto your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Untoward means unexpected and inappropriate. Even back then he was talking about how the generation was just over the top. We need to save ourselves. And if we, if we read this word, we can put this into now because this generation again is just over the top with things that are just inappropriate. Right. Things that they're trying to say is okay, but it's inappropriate. Just because man wants it to go down, man wants it to happen, they're allowing it because the people say it, so let's do it. Kind of like how Pilate just let them crucify Jesus because the people were voting for it, and he didn't want to get taken away. This is... This is this is something that we need to be aware of and, and we gotta we gotta prepare ourselves for questions so that we cannot we don't have to be a stumbling block or cause confusion when we're trying to help. Right. And and if you go down to Acts two forty three, it says, And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. This is quickly after they just baptized three thousand individuals from what Peter said, from what Peter was speaking on when the Lord was speaking through him. They just baptized 3,000 individuals. But it says, and fear came upon every soul. That doesn't mean they were scared or anything like that, but there was respect in the God of the man who was speaking. And this is something that this generation needs to understand, is that respect and honor towards the men of God because they just see them as, oh, he just said it as a man. Yeah, he's, just, he's, he's, just, he's up there because uh, he decided to start a church. We need to get that out of our minds. We need to let these individuals understand it. And I appreciate um, Brother Milton because I see his respect and honor that he has for our pastor. And he's, he's brand new. And he sees that awesome, that, that great example that our pastor is and the Lord within our pastor. And, and, I, and I love that because I, I just, I respect that. I, I really do. I, I believe in our pastor and it, and it encouraged me and it encourages me to see everyone else falling under our pastor and, and really trying to push him and keeping his hands up so that this church can move forward. Now it's a quick and easy expectation in our world today. It's a microwave world. We want things now, 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 a spoiled generation, but sometimes because of that, we're moving here and there. We need everything now. We're blinding ourselves from his presence. We're blinding ourselves to his presence because we're praying quick and we're going. But our prayer is just lip service. Our prayer is not heartfelt. Our prayer is not earnest. The Bible talks about when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane that he prayed more earnestly. And that is something, this is why there was blood that was mingled with sweat. His 
spirit was fighting with his flesh because he was, he was dealing with something so profound, something so excruciating, and he knew it was going to happen. And he was, his body, his physical was trying to be scared, but he was sinless. The Bible says in, um, in Romans um, that there was, there was fear, but that, that word fear, it, we, we cannot, we got we to gotta look at the translations. That word fear just translates to respect. It means honor. It means reverence because he was a great example showing us how to pray, how to pray. Not my will be done, but Lord, your will be done. And that's exactly how we need to go about our day. We cannot go, oh, in the name of Jesus, Lord, bless them. Uh, yeah, and keep driving. Or we're working and we got a bunch of things on our mind. And we're all guilty. Of I'm guilty of this. When somebody, you see somebody hurting, but you got, things, you got things going on and you're not exactly where you need to be and you just keep moving. When that person was waiting on some type of word, you don't know what this situation that person was dealing with. And, and that's why I wanted, I'm, I'm speaking about Paul being such a great example. I'm talking about Jesus being such a great example in the Garden of Gethsemane. Yeah. Blood was mingled with his sweat. That's something called hemo, hematidrosis. That's a medical term. And the only other situation that I found researching this out was a little girl from World War I. When she came out of the war, she was in a PO. Uh, prisoner, of, prisoner of war camp, POW, um, and she, she was able to escape. They got her out. This is, at, this is um, post, is it post-war? After the war, okay? And there was a gas explosion in the apartment next to her. She got so stressed out that she began to sweat, and she was worrying that these things were happening all over again, and sweat began to mingle with her blood, or blood began to mingle with her sweat. That's the only time that I could find, other than here, that it confirms this situation because you know how doctors they're trying to figure out is this true is this word real and right away the, the Lord made sure that there was another person <laughs> that had this thing going on as well um, but yes he was dealing with so much stress his physical wanted to just run away but he said Lord but your will be done so his spirit took reign he prayed more earnestly in um, let me see, let me see, I'm sorry. Paul understood setting his flesh aside just like, just like we should, doing his will. He was shipwrecked three times. He was shipwrecked three times, still speaking God's word and remaining selfless. In Acts 28, if we can just move back a little bit, Acts 28, and I was kind of getting ahead of myself, but in Acts 28, it says... 28, 3 through 6, it says, And when Paul had gathered a bundle, of, a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came out a viper out of the heat and fastened onto his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. He shook, this viper came out from the fire. Now these vipers, if you go back and you research them, they have heat sensors. And this is why after they bite their, their, their prey, they let go. And that prey moves about while it's dying, and they seek it with its heat sensors. This is why I believe this, this viper was in the fire, was close to the fire, because with its heat sensors, he found it. Last on to Paul, Paul shook it off and went about his, went about his work. Because I believe that when situations, and this is how I, I move this around, is... When situations come upon us, we need to not dwell on it. We need to not wonder about it. We need to not, Lord, why is this going on with me? We need to just, we need to just move on, get in prayer, do your thing, and, and move on. What the Lord wants you to do, keep going, keep, keep your eyes up, and stop worrying about what's going on in your, in your physical life. Right now, we're dealing with stuff too, but I'm not worried about that. I know that the Lord is going to come and he's going to do his thing as long as I'm looking up to him and I'm doing what I need to do for the Lord. He's going to do what he's going to do for me. So Paul shook off the venomous viper 
and he went about his day. He went about what needed to be done. Paul still remained in God's will, working in his name. And then if you move down to verse 8, And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. He was still doing the work of God, being selfless, regardless of the bite on his hand, regardless of hours ago, he was floating in on a piece of wood. He still, Lord, in Jesus' name, i got to do your work. He prayed for the men and healed them. This is what we need to do. We need to keep our eyes on the Lord and do what he wants us to do. If we see somebody in pain, we forget about what we're doing, we need to go talk to that person. This is something that we need to understand. I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm seeing this in myself, and that's why I'm, 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 I'm so um, passionate about it because there's something in me that needs to come out, and I need to make sure that I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on people and I'm, and I'm, I'm in the love of God because he loves the people. He died on the cross for not just me. It's not a selfish thing. This is an everybody thing. We need to make sure that we're preaching his word and doing what the Bible says. Go ye therefore teaching all nations. And I'm part of that. And you are part of that. Paul did not care what was going on with his hand, swollen or not. He had holes in it from the viper. He would still use that hand to pray. He wasn't worried about if he was going to get sick. He wasn't worried about if he was going to die. The Lord needed him for his work, so he kept on moving. If the Lord put you in this church, you're not going to die tomorrow. He put you here for a purpose, and he's going to fulfill that purpose in your life if you only believe, if you only believe. So if you get diagnosed with something tomorrow, you need to know that the Lord is going to heal you. You need to have the belief and the faith in our God to move on and, and keep doing his will. Because if for a second we doubt, that second could be the decision. That second could be the reason why either we aren't in his will or we are. That could be the reason why we fall away or we stay. Seek him in his righteousness first. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane is one of the greatest teaching moments that Jesus ever displayed. And they were falling asleep. And it's, and it's hard because there's a lot of things that our pastor does that we, we shy away from that we're like, yeah. But that man is, is, is old in age and he's still doing things that I should be doing. That he's working like a dog and he's still selfless with his, with his wife. He comes home and, he, and he's still, even though he's dog tired from the situations that he's dealing with, not only with himself and his situation, but everybody here getting phone calls and doing everything that he does. And he goes home and he spends time with his wife. He treats her like a queen, like we all should treat our wives and our husbands treating them like a king. He prays and he reads and he, does, and he comes up here and he preaches and we fall asleep. Or we're not paying attention. Or we're thinking about something else when the Lord is literally moving through him for you, for me, and we're not paying attention. We're missing our blessing. In Luke 22, Luke 22, I love Luke because I believe he's the only one who, who mentioned Jesus sweating blood because he was a physician. He understood that part and, and he recorded it. Luke twenty two forty two through 44 says, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. The Lord is going to take care of us. The Lord is going to see us in our situation, and he's going to take care of us. He's going to move his angels to move us and to guide us and to, and to move us where we need to be moved and to move other people where they need to be moved to protect us and to keep us. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was that were great drops, of fall, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. He wasn't wanting this. His flesh did not want what was going to happen in the future. His flesh did not want it. Not being in fear of it because fear was the opposite of faith. 
and that leads to sin. He was sinless, but being conflicted, his spirit fighting with his flesh, this medical condition began to come to pass. This hemotidrosis, where he was sweating mixed with blood. In Hebrews 5, 7, that's the scripture I was thinking about. It says fear, in that he feared. But that's not something to show that he was scared because if he was scared, there would be sin. He was sinless. It means reverence and honored. But he prayed more earnestly to remove these thoughts and remain in the spirit. Earnestly in this scripture translates to sincere and intense convictions. He prayed for this for the situation that was coming to pass. To stay in the will to stay in the spirit, to not let his flesh override his spirit. And this was for you and me because he had to go. He knew he had to go and deal with these situations, these beatings, and all the things that were coming to place to be crucified for you and for me. So ultimately, he was praying more earnestly for us. Ultimately, he was praying more earnestly for this world. For us to be saved, for us because of his love for us. And this is this 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 word earnestly is what we need to understand for when we pray. When we go to bed at night, when we wake up in the morning, to pray earnestly for everyone here, to pray earnestly for the situation in your life, to touch somebody else, to to, to keep that big picture of I need to do something for the Lord today. I need to bless the Lord today. Not anything selfish, not nothing for yourself. Obviously, yeah, there's things that we need to pray for ourselves. We can't, we can't forget about ourselves because if we don't love ourselves, how can we love anybody else? But we need to concentrate on what the will of God is in our lives, not our will. And in this word it says, and being in an agony. Agony in, this, in the Greek means to be engaged in combat. He was fighting. He was fighting. Jesus was battling his flesh and the enemy and many upcoming events. He knew we're coming and that we're going to come to, uh, go and come to pass. We cannot, we cannot compare with this situation because none of us has seen our future and death coming. But we can fashion ourselves as he did when this, in this situation. Believe when we believe that we are in agony, when we're in our situation, when we're facing our giant, that we pray more earnestly for ourselves and for one another. We cannot let the enemy or our flesh take us and blind us to God's power that is within us. People may say things to discourage you. People may say things to move you. People may say things to, to keep you from the faith, to confuse you. But we need to understand that the Lord's power is within us and we can just shake that off like Paul did, and keep going. Yes. In Luke 17, 20, 21, 17, 21, it says, Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, but for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. We need to understand yes. this. We need to understand that we have power in Jesus. We have power because He is within us. Yes. We need to walk with confidence, and that's something I've always yes. had a problem with. Walk with confidence, not in yourself, but in the God that lives within you. Right. To move and to everything that you do, even in your job, we need to move as if the Lord is moving us. As if, as if the Lord is, is, is speaking to us because we can hear his voice, that still small voice. Evangelist Freeman just prayed for that, to be louder. And that's what we all need to pray for. Let that voice speak to us. Let him speak to Let it be a dialogue when we pray, not just us what is that, a monologue where we're just talking, we're not hearing anything? Gehazi was the hand of Elisha. He fell because he was greedy. He fell because he, he, he decided not to do what the man of God said and not take Naaman's gold and his treasures. But he was like, you know what, I'm going to take it anyways. Nobody's looking. He hid it. And the same leprosy that was on Naaman fell upon uh, Gehazi. And it took seven years for him to live in this pain, for his, extre his extremities to fall off. That's what this causes, to be white as snow. The Bible says it fell on him right away. This didn't happen over time like this disease usually started. It, happened, it fell upon him right away. 
But it took him seven years to finally come to that test one more time to choose no. Last time was bad for me. I need to choose the Lord right now because I don't know what's going to happen if I choose bad again. He put that gold from those, um, from those, um, um, forgive me, Lord. Um, he took the gold from those, uh, the people in the army that were outside the city. And he looked at it and he said, not today. I'm not doing this. And the city outside was starving and they had the this, this decision to eat like kings to, to take all the, the, the gold and the garments and the food while everybody was starving and dying. But he said, no, no I can't do this. This is not what, I, I, last time I did this, it destroyed my life. I need to go tell somebody. So as he was walking, I believe the Lord was healing him because he repented and he did the right thing again. He, he was able to get that second chance because we all have a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance. The Lord is always going to be there with His mercy and His grace to bring you back in His arms. Gehazi chose to do right the second time around. Living seven years outside the city where they throw the dump, where they throw the trash and they throw everything else, eating trash, where they burn the trash. He was, that's where he lived. But he decided to do right and the Lord began to heal him. And he came back and now he was the king's right hand man later in scripture. Peter denied Jesus three times. But after his repentance, it said that he wept bitterly. I believe he was so angry within himself about what he did that he, he repented on such a great level and he forgave himself. The Lord forgave him first, but he had to forgive himself and he became a great man of God. A great man of God. His mercy endureth forever. However many times it takes you, the Lord is going to receive you back. But we need to be aware that we cannot take this for granted. We cannot just decide, you know what, I, it's hard, I'm going to do that today. I'll just go back tomorrow because tomorrow is not granted to us. Tomorrow is not for sure. In Acts 3.12-15, through 15, Peter was talking, Acts 3.12-15, through 15. it says, And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Right now, this is right after God, uh, the Lord healed through him, healed the man at the gate called Beautiful. A man that sat there every day, and they seen that he, he couldn't walk. A man sat there, I'm sorry, yeah. Everybody seen, passed by. Everybody knew this person. Every day. The Lord healed him through Peter. He said, um, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our power or holiness we made this man walk? The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life whom God hath raised from the dead whereof we are witnesses. Now this is Peter telling them that they, they denied the God of this planet. Right after he denied him three times. Now, what gives Peter the right, if anybody there is thinking this, what gives you the right to tell us that when you did it yourself? What gives you the right to talk to us and condemn us, not condemn, but let us know our situation when you did it too? The only reason is, is because Peter repented correctly. Peter turned his life around correctly and, and, and acknowledged what he did and changed his life towards the better, towards what the Lord wanted for him in his life. So somebody can come to you and be like, you know what, you can't talk to me because I knew your past. I knew what you were back then. You can't, you can't tell me, but you can because you lived it. You can preach it. You got over it. You let the Lord restore you. You got over that hump. You are, now you can show them the way on how you got over it, on how the Lord healed you, and you have a testimony now. That's called a testimony. The Lord took you out and brought you into His marvelous light. 
Peter had a testimony, and he could tell them, yeah, you did it, but I know a way on how to get yourself right. I know a way. I know a God that can yes. restore you. So somebody can come to you and be like, you can't talk to me about God. I knew you in your past. Yes, you can. Yes, I can talk to you about the Lord because I'm not that person anymore. I don't live like that anymore. And let me tell you what you can do to be in the will of God. Some may say that Peter can't talk, but he can. He lived it, he repented, and he forgave himself. And we need to forgive ourselves of the things that we did in our past because it's holding us back we're the only reason we're not moving forward we're standing in front of ourselves and being like you did this you did this maybe there's not accusers out there accusing you you're accusing yourself and you need to forgive yourself you need to look at yourself and let the Lord restore you because your unforgiveness of yourself is not letting the Lord restore you in Acts 3.19, it says, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. That refreshing shall come. It's not an option. Once you repent, the Lord shall restore you. Once you forgive yourself, the Lord shall restore you from His presence. So we must stay in His presence. Do not forget about 1 Thessalonians 4.16. We which are alive in him and remain in him will meet the Lord remain and he will preserve you remain stay here we don't have many here today but you guys are here you chose to fly the friendly skies <laughs> of the apostolic road because we we preach the truth this is where you come to find rest this is where you come to find healing it's a hospital if we're hurting we should be here we shouldn't stay at home Right now, my foot, I, I don't know how I hurt my foot, but my, foot, my hooded foot is killing me. <laughs> my stomach is hurting. I don't know there's a bug between, I don't know what's going on, but my stomach is hurting so bad. But this is a hospital. We come here to be healed. We're hurting inside. We come here to be healed. Our past is, is haunting us. We come here to be healed, to be restored. Continually shake off these venomous people. Shake off these venomous thoughts. Shake off these venomous accusations that are coming against you and discouraging you and keeping you from doing the will of God. Shake them off and move forward. Don't let your past haunt you. Forgive yourself. Preach and teach and pray more earnestly for others as you would for yourself. Like Pastor says all the time, when people are up here praying, pray with us. Work with us. We don't know what situation they're dealing with. Maybe they didn't say. But there's something hard that they're going through. There's a giant that they're facing that they need to slay. And we're here as a family to help. We need to pray more earnestly for them. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.14. 5.14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient towards all men. Comfort, warn, support, be patient. Our pastor has warned us. Our pastor has comforted us. When has he supported you when you wanted to do something? I'm sure every single time. Has he ever been patient with you? If we're here, he's been patient with us. <laughs> If we're here, he's been patient. You cannot say that we were, we were the most uh, loyal subject, especially in the beginning. But our pastor is such an example. Our pastor is such a great man of God that has done everything here. He has warned us. He has comforted us. He has supported us. He has been patient towards us. And this is what I'm trying to say. We need to follow after these great examples. Jesus first. We see Paul acting and, and being selfless in the Bible, literally just floated in on a piece of wood, praying for somebody, not thinking about himself, just got bit by a viper, not worried about if he's going to die that moment before. And our pastor that is up here each and every Sunday, each and every Wednesday, yeah. only a call away. If you need help, you know he's going to come to you. That's the type of pastor we have. These are the type of examples that we need to live after. 
Remain in the faith, and God will keep you. In Jesus' name, that's all I have for you. Woo! Praise the Lord. Thank you. Hallelujah. If El Dottino can come up and pray us out. Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. That was supersonic. Heavy duty. Amen. And I praise God. I want, I want everybody, I, I'll throw a, a suggestion out there like Pastor does. I suggest that we all go through the book of Mark, or at least chapter 16 of Mark, because that something that Elder is talking about that is within him is within all of us. And if you just take that advice and take that suggestion, read the 16th chapter of the book of Mark, Sunday is going to make a lot more sense. Because I feel the Lord doing the move because that's something, that's why I was so excited when you were preaching, that something that you said can and well, will be revealed on Sunday. I feel it in my spirit. Amen. And with that, I just want to close with the scripture. 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, Therefore, if any man or woman, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he or she is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. There's a, there's a thing there. It's, it's about belief. Amen? Because if we're in Christ, then we are changed. We are new. We are not what we once were. Amen? All right. Well, praise God. 16th chapter of the book of Mark. Read it. Fill it up real good. Just Reread it if you have to, amen. If there's any questions, reach out to the ministerial staff, amen. And, uh, and, and, and let's come with an expectant heart and spirit, amen. Because I believe with all that is, with, that is within me that's, that the Lord is going to show out on Sunday. And not because of any one person, but because of us collectively. Amen. Be one mind, one car. Let us, oh, uh, this Saturday is the men's breakfast, 10 a.m., Stockholm. 9.30? 9.30. Uh, Stockholm Inn. And then next Saturday, uh, hallelujah, the following Saturday, something about a playground. I ain't worried about uh, not <laughs> this, Friday, this Friday, youth at Nickel World, 7? 5? 5 and a half. Okay, so this Friday, 5.30, Nickel World, bring bones. This Saturday, Stockholm in 930. Sunday after church, church pastors preaching in Aurora, Pastor Walker's church. Well, Jesus Church, Pastor Walker is the pastor. Amen. And then the following Saturday, the playground. Hallelujah. Even though it's going to be cold soon, but that's all right. Hallelujah. Okay. <laughs> Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word anointed, Lord. We pray right now, Lord God, that you allow us to retain this word. Re bring back to our remembrance the examples and the awesome scripture that you gave your son, Lord God, to give to us. We pray that it continues to enlighten us throughout the week, Lord, and bring us back home here on Sunday morning, Lord God, for prayer, for Spanish, for prayer, for Bible study, and for worship. In Jesus' mighty name, take us all home to our prospective places. In your holiest name, and I pray right now, and I believe this with all my heart, that as we pray this evening, Lord God, let it go, as, let it go up as incense before your nostrils in Jesus' name. And everybody says, Amen. Amen.